Great. Thank you all for joining us today at the um, session two for the community project funding cohorts. This session will be on budget. And I see a few more people still rolling in here. But we're going to go ahead and get started so that we can use our full time today. So during the presentation, uh, everyone will be muted during the webinar. Um, these PowerPoint slides will be available on the HUD Exchange after the session, probably in a few days. Um, so keep an eye out for that. For those of you who have not and uh, visited the HUD Exchange before for the CPF program. It is a great resource. You can see here a screenshot of one of the pages on the HUD Exchange. There are general resources, um, specific resources to the cohort, and then um, some news and announcements. So definitely keep an eye on the information that's available on the HUD Exchange because it's great resources. For today's session, we encourage folks to submit questions. Um, we'd love your content related questions related to budget. Uh, we're gonna use the chat function today to accept your questions. If you are not familiar with Zoom, which I'm sure everybody here is, but if you go to the main toolbar, there's a little bubble that says chat, you click on that, make sure you are chatting to everyone and then everyone will see the questions that you are posing, and then we'll go through them as we go through the presentation. We'll take some breaks to answer the questions relevant to those sections, but um, we will also have a general Q&A at the end where we can follow up on anything we may have missed or any additional questions that folks write in. If there are any questions that we can't answer today, we will be logging those questions and answering them later. Um, so fear not drop your questions in. There's also the opportunity to have questions answered during the office hours section um, next week. So that's another opportunity for us to follow up on more case specific questions. We can talk about them in more depth there. But no need to hold your questions. Please share them and we will get to them either today or soon. So for today's agenda, we're going to do some introductions in just a moment. Um, we're also going to have an overview of the cohort program for those who may be joining for the first time. If you happen to have missed the first session, we are also going to do a narrative uh, recap. So session one was on narratives. And we'll be recapping what's included, uh, what was included in that presentation just at a high level. You can always access the slides for more detail on session one. But for today, we're gonna to be getting into some details related to constructing your budget for your program. And so we're gonna be looking at construction budgets, both in on, on a line item basis and um, talk about determining amounts. And we'll also look at non-construction projects and budgets for those types of projects. We'll talk a bit about amendments as well. We all know that things change, particularly as you're in, at the beginning of project planning. You might anticipate some changes to your budgets over the course of your program. So we will talk about how amendments would be made. And then finally, we will provide some just high level information about DRGR. So for some of you, that may be a new acronym. We'll talk about what that acronym is and how you're gonna use DRGR, which is a system where um, you will set up your project and that's where you will draw your funds. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. There'll be more to come on DRGR in the future, but we wanna give folks just a, a basic understanding of what that is because you will hear more about it as you go along. So for introductions, my name is Jennifer Alfine with TDA Consulting. I'm a senior consultant. Here at TDA, I've been with TDA about 12 years. Um, I've been working on a range of HUD programs, including HOME, NSP, CDBG, um, and many others. But in addition to that, we've been um, working on these cohort series for CPF. And I'm joined today by Stan Fitterman. Stan, would you like to say hello? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Stan Fitterman. I've got over 25 years experience in HUD, CDBG, HOME, and other community and economic development programs. I also do a lot of deal-specific work 
with the developers of affordable housing and permanent supportive housing. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And then we want to let our HUD folks say hello today, Connor. Hey, everyone. My name is Connor Leroux. Um, I am with HUD, with the Congressional Grants Division, uh, working to coordinate on TA projects like this to help all of you CPF grantees um, get fully executed as soon as possible. Uh, thank you again for joining us for the second session. We're really excited to have you all um, come to this session and really hope that it's helpful for everybody. And I believe Chantel is on the other session that's running concurrent to this. Um, so I think we can move on from there. Okay, great. Yes, we've got lots of lots of sessions running for CPF right now. So thank you all for being here. We want to get to know a little bit about you all. Um, so we have a few, just a few get to know you polls so that we can better understand where you are in the process of um, getting your materials together. And so I'm going to launch the first poll. And Jennifer, I think you start with number four on the polls. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Dan. Okay, so. This is the one. All right. So our first question, where are you in the grant award process? Did you just start to work on the packet? Did you submit the packet, but uh, you were asked to revise it? Or are you waiting for the grant agreement from HUD? For those of you who are waiting on your grant agreement, that means you you may have already submitted your materials. I guess everybody's waiting if you haven't already signed it, um, but for or haven't already gotten a signed one back. But for those who may have already submitted your materials and you're just waiting to get that grant agreement back, that's the one that's that we're thinking about there. All right. So we've got almost everybody who's answered. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and see where we landed. Um, looks like about 73% of folks are just starting to work on their application packet. And that would make sense since these cohorts are designed to help folks through the process of assembling your materials. So that's good to understand, but it's nice to see that some of you have already gotten started on the process. Um, and may need to make some revisions. So thank you for being here because hopefully these sessions will help you better understand what HUD's looking for. Um, and if you have questions in any regard, please do ask them. All right, so then moving on to the next poll. Hmm, for some reason, I'm not able to launch. Wait one second, let me start over with the launch. It's to launch better. Right. Okay, here we go. There we go. Question number two, have you received federal funds in the past? This will help us understand if folks are familiar with complying with the federal requirements. Almost everyone responding. We'll give you a few more seconds. See if we can get everybody's answers logged. All right, so let's see what we've got. Okay, so it looks like about 71% of folks have received federal funds in the past. That's great. That's going to give you, you know, a, a foundational understanding of the things that HUD is going to be looking for terms of compliance with the program, um, but we do have about a third of the folks who have not received federal funds in the past. So that's helpful for us to understand as well. So 
Thanks for answering that question. All right, we'll go to the next question. And so we are asking, have you started drafting your budget yet? We've got about two more folks left to answer. We'll give you a few seconds. <clears throat> okay, let's see what the poll says. Okay, so it's about half and half. About, fo about a little less than half of you who answered have started, and um, about a little teeny tiny bit more than half have not started. So we've got a good mix of folks. Um, so for those of you that have not started yet, we'll be giving you a basic understanding of what your budget setup um, will need to include. And then for those of you who have started, perhaps you have some questions that you wanna ask as, um, as you've been working through the process. And then we've got one final question in our Get to Know You series. Have you signed up for the HUD Exchange mailing list? All right, so we've got a few people still rolling in. We'll give you another couple seconds to answer this question. Looks like more than half of you need to go sign up for the HUD Exchange mailing list. <laughs> so far it does. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna share these results. So it looks, like, yeah, about even split again um, with a little more than you saying, no, you haven't signed up yet. So we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Um, this is going to be a great resource as you move forward with your program. So you're definitely going to want to sign up for the mailing list and we'll show you where the do, where you can do that. All right. Thank you all for participating in those polls. It gives us a nice sense of where folks are at in the process. Okay. So moving on in our slides. Um, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, the, the HUD exchange is a wealth of resources on all HUD programs, including CPF. There's a specific landing page for CPF. Um, on this landing page, you can get the grant guides. You can also request program support. Um, and this is where um, you'll be able to access the um, ask a question, um, where you can contact HUD and um, seek additional support for your program if you need answers to any questions following this. Um, so definitely get familiar with the HUD exchange. It's where you can find a lot of, of the guidance documents that we'll be talking about throughout the cohort series. Ask a question. For those of you who are not familiar with Ask a Question, it is a great resource where you can pose a question to the experts that are answering those questions as they come through and get a pretty quick response. Sometimes if it's a more complicated question, the response might take a little longer, but it does funnel the question directly um, into the hands of folks who can help you. So definitely use this as a resource as you move forward in your program. Um, you are uh, very wise in signing up for the cohort series. So you have some additional support over these next few weeks where you can come to office hours, come to these sessions, ask questions. But as you move forward, the ask a question is a great resource for you as well. And you can find that on the HUD exchange. And then for those, the half of you who have not yet signed up for the CPF mailing list, you do that on the HUD exchange as well. Um, you want to go to this uh, website here, www.hudexchange.info slash mailing list slash subscribe. Um, 
And you can find this easily on the HUD exchange just by um, going to the little search and putting in mailing lists, uh, it will come up. And then you want to choose the EDI-CPF program when you sign up for the mailing list. If you are receiving other federal funds and you were not aware that this was a resource, you can see here from the screenshot that there are mailing lists for all the HUD programs, the HUD systems. Um, so if this is news to you, definitely check all the boxes that apply to the work you're doing, um, but certainly check that CPF box. And then as new materials are made available, they are released onto the HUD exchange, but also alerts are sent out on the, the mailing list. All right, and with that, we're gonna get into the content for today. So as you know, this cohort series is a way for HUD to assist CPF grantees with the completion of the materials that are required for you to execute your uh, grant agreement, to have a fully executed grant agreement sent back and to initiate your project, which includes getting access to your funds. So the cohort series has four sessions that walk you through the components of the materials that you need to submit. We started with the project narrative in the last session. Today we'll be talking about budget. We have a follow-up to this budget session on February 13th, where we will be able to answer more detailed questions in office hours. Um, after this session, we're going to be giving you a lot of information today. You can take it back digest it, apply it to the development of your budget, and then come to office hours next week with any questions you might have. And hopefully this will help you move along the process of actually getting a budget created that you can submit with your package. The following session on February 20th is gonna be environmental. And then on March 5th, we'll be talking about the forms that are a part of the required package as well. And that will wrap up our cohort series. So just to um, recap the session one topic, which was narratives, um, for those of you who perhaps were not available to attend that session, um, we're just gonna give you a real quick recap on what was covered there. So for your project narrative in your materials, you're going to include a project description, project metrics, a timeline and status, and then you're gonna talk about any proposed subrecipients. Now there's no prescribed format for the narrative. However, there are specific types of information that HUD will be looking for as they review your narrative. So we want to make sure that your project description has your project name, address, you state the purpose of the project, and then you provide a narrative description. You have to match the joint explanatory statement um, unless that's been corrected or amended. And you wanna describe all of the actions that will be undertaken as part of the project, regardless of the funding source. So you wanna describe the project in full, um, not just those portions that are gonna be funded by CPF. For your project metrics, um, here you wanna have clearly stated goals and outcomes for your project. You also want to discuss any performance measures for section three if your activity types trigger section three. So here you would include metrics for total labor hours and targeted section three labor hours. And then in your timeline, you're gonna discuss the current status of your project. So where it is currently at, if you're at the beginning, where you are in the development of um, your project, you're gonna provide a proposed timeline and you're going to clarify the environmental review status. For your timeline, you wanna talk about estimated start and end dates, end dates for your projects um, and any steps that you've taken towards environmental review. And then for proposed subrecipients, you want to describe why your project is best implemented by a subrecipient if that is your purpose or your approach. Um, and then you want to describe the subrecipient roles and the scope that's going to be handled by each of the subrecipients. And again, there isn't a prescribed format for this, but you want to make sure that you're covering all these different topics in your narratives. 
Um, and you can refer to the grant guide, the fiscal year 23 grant gui guide. It is on the HUD exchange. Um, and you can also refer to the slides from session one, which dive into these topics in a little bit more detail. So that's our session one recap. So now I will turn it over to Stan, who will get us started on budget. All right. And I want to uh, uh, say that uh, an apology is due. We didn't change the slide with the dates for the because um, we're doing two cohorts this week. So uh, one of the questions was about the date. So the next one for environmental review for this group will be on the 15th. I'm sorry, on the 22nd. And following that will be the uh, um, the other one. I believe it's March 7th. So the dates that y'all have are correct. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. And we will make a note to make sure we uh, change that slide from now on. So, okay. Okay, so we're we're seeing my screen, I take it, Jennifer? Yes, looks great. All right, so let's talk about basic budgets. Sorry, budget basics, that's very different. Okay, so <laughs> line item. Um, we need to submit a line item budget with our grant agreement, okay? And we're gonna walk through an example in a second of what that'll look like. But I wanna remind you that we need to include the uses for the entire project, so not just the CPF part. And we're gonna have two columns, one that says CPF, and one that says non-CPF amounts. The total amount you show on your budget of the CPF fund column, that total, needs to equal the CPF award. So round up, round down, whatever you need to do, but you've got to make sure that the CPF amount um, matches, the, uh, matches your award amount. Okay. All right. Um, there we go. Okay. The budget also needs to be consistent with the project narrative and with the uh, with the JES, the Joint Explanatory Statement. So, for example, if the project narrative says we're going to build something, then we need to have a construction line item in our in our budget. If uh, and, and we put here the link, but the joint explanatory statement can be found at this link. And the HUD recipient section begins on page that S9, S9406. Okay. You can create your own budget format in Excel or Word. And what this really means is it can be a spreadsheet or it can be a, a word processing document. It could be Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets, but it can be something that you create or we're going to look at an example, a template that, that is on uh, grants.gov in the form section, which is the SF-424B, which is for non-construction programs, and the S-24D, which has line items you usually use in a construction program, okay? Um, some grantee programs require both. If you're buying a building and you're going to rehab it, and you're going to use this money for running a program out of it, you would use line items from both of the budgets we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. All right. Okay. Jennifer, are you in charge of the polls again? Yes, I am. All right. Let me get the next one started. One second here. Sorry, it's not letting me launch. Let me pop out and back into the poll function. We're having a, I've not had poll difficulty before. This is a new one, a new quirk. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sonia, are you there? Are you able to launch the poll number one? For some yes, reason? Let, me, let me see if I can do that. It's not letting, it's not the launch button isn't, it's grayed out for some reason. There we go. Actually, it's, it's just popped um, up. Okay, yeah, just have to stop the sharing from the other. Okay. 
Okay, I'll go ahead and launch that. Great, here we go. What is, this is wrong, sorry. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. No worries, it should be the session two. There we go, got it. All, All right. right. There you go. Oh, that was more painful than it should have been. Okay. The budget must include uses for the entire project with the CPF and non-CPF funds identified separately. True or false? Okay, we're back. We're up to, well, one or two more stragglers. Okay, we're going to call it. So, yes, 98% of you got this one correct. True. The budget has to include uses for the entire project. And we're going to have, remember, we said we'd have two columns, one that has the CPF amount and one that has the non-CPF amount. All right, very good. Great. Next. Great, we'll go to the next question. All right. So the, um, okay, that's, okay, there we go. So with the SF-424 forms for budget information for construction and non-construction may be used for your CPF budget, must be used for your CPF budget, or cannot be used for your CPF budget. Okay, about another, let's do another 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. About 12 more folks who can still chime in. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and end it. All right. And so about 71% of y'all got this one correct. They can be used as a template. There's no requirement that they do. They do, they can't, that they must be used. You can use your own budget template, your own format, but these are forms that can be used um, for submitting your budget. So they don't have to be, but they can be. So A is the correct answer there. Great. Good job, everyone. Move on to number three. Okay. The budget does not need to be consistent with the narrative nor the joint explanatory statement provided the budget includes an explanation of the differences. True or false? Okay. Yep. All right, we're at 91%. So um, that statement is false. The budget has to be consistent with your narrative and it has to be consistent with the joint explanatory statement. So the, the answer to that one is false. It's gotta be consistent with your narrative and, your, and the JES. All right, good job, everybody. Yeah, all right, winners. <laughs> Okay, so sample, this is a sample construction budget format. Again, it is um, it is optional to use. It's not required. But these are the type of line items we would expect to see in a budget that has construction as one as the use. okay? So administrative expenses and legal expenses. What's our lawyer going to cost us? Are we spending any money on administration? Um, in addition to doing this project. Land, structures, waterways, appraisals, are we buying things? If we're buying something. This is where the cost of buying the land or buying the building would go. If we're buying an occupied house or occupied building and we're gonna have to relocate um, uh, people who are renting their tenants, either residential or business, this is where we would put that, that amount. Architectural and engineering fees. We either we're more than likely we either 
already have an estimate from in-house or we're gonna to need to get an estimate of what our architectural and engineering fees are expected to cost. Other architectural and engineering fees are things that are done by an architect and an engineer, but not actual architectural engineering. So like surveys, soil tests, any studies like that that aren't related to architectural and engineering would go in this line item. Our funders often require us to have inspections, especially we and we as a developer would want to have inspections, periodic inspections to make sure that the building is being rehabbed or built to our specifications and the quality is what we want. So this will really put what those inspector costs are going to be. Every, uh, almost every construction project, we're doing new construction is gonna require site work. We're gonna be grading geotechnical work, uh, perhaps taking down some trees, planting some trees. This is where we would put our site work. If we're going to be just demolishing a building and getting rid of it, that's where this would go. Construction, what it's actually costing us to build the thing or rehab it. Equipment, any equipment that we're buying as part of our grant. Um, miscellaneous, anything that isn't included in these one through 10, and it would be something that we would put, we would want to put specifically what's in the miscellaneous, what the light items are. So it could be you know, impact fees, permit fees, whatever we're uh, not included in one through 10. In construction, things always go wrong. And so as a result, we're going to have contingencies. So somebody, something happens, there's, so, there's a easement they didn't find until after they started construction. The soil type was a little different than they thought, and it's going to need to take a different, a little extra so fill than we thought. Things go wrong in construction. They especially go wrong in rehab. You take out a wall and realize that the, the termites have eaten a lot of the wood, a lot of the, um, a lot of the studs in the wall. So things go wrong in, in construction projects. So we want to budget a contingency. We are um, uh, with two CFR. We need to be necessary and reasonable. Broadly speaking, I must be very broadly speaking. Contingencies are usually 5% for new construction and 10% for rehab, and usually 5% of soft cost, broadly speaking. Yours may differ. You may have reasons. You do higher or lower, but that's broadly speaking where the, where the range is. If we're going to expect any program income to offset some of these costs, we would put that here, and then we would take our subtotal, subtract any project program project income that's going to be used toward this project, if we have any, not many of you will, um, and that's our total project cost. Again, big note at the bottom, this is a sample, it's not a required form, but it is a, um, it is something that we can use if you don't have another budget already. Okay. Here is a sample non-construction budget format. Now, if you're doing construction and you're going to do a service, you would use line items from both of these budgets, and that's perfectly fine. So personnel, what's our personnel? What's our cost? If someone's going to devote half their time to this uh, program, we would charge 50% of their personnel cost. Fringe benefits are an allowable expense. So we would want to calculate what the fringe benefits are, the actual cost of the fringe benefits, and apply that to our total cost. Any travel or equipment? And let's pause for an equipment for a second. Equipment is anything that's going to last, have an effective useful life of more than a year, and it's going to cost more than $5,000. If you have an agency or local government policy that says equipment is lower than 5,000, you use your, your number. You don't use the 5,000. If you have something that's higher than 5,000, you use 5,000. So computers, most of them, unless you're buying something extremely special, computers are generally less than $5,000. They're not equipment. Printers, not equipment. Over 5,000, effective use of the life of more than a year. Supplies are generally the other stuff you buy, less than $5,000. That that uh, so post-it notes, paper clips. You would not have those. Would be supplies, computers, a supply, contractual. Anything, anyone you're going to hire to contract with to run your program that you're going to spend money on for this project. Anything that's not covered. Oops. Ah. 
There we go. Um, anything that's not covered um, uh, in A through F, we would put as other. Indirect charges, we're gonna talk about those on the next slide. So we'll just hold that thought for a minute. And then the direct charges plus the indirect charges are your totals for each column. And again, sample form. And again, you may use line items from both the construction and the non-construction budget, depending on what your project is. All right, so let's talk about uh, indirect cost. So this is gonna be things like our finance department, our personnel department, finance. It's gonna be something that costs are incurred for a common and joint purpose, and they benefit more than one cost objective. And more importantly, they're not easily assignable to the cost objectives benefited without a disproportionate effort to the results achieved. Let's take an example, finance department. We could, ask our finance person to track every line item that every entry in the financial records that, she, that he or she uses. So every time you buy something, every time you get a check-in, every time you have an expense, that they would track how many times that they entered something for the CPF grant and then do a percentage of all of the financial entries they make and say, oh, okay, oh, it's 2% of your time. We're gonna charge 2% of your time to uh, the CPF grant. That's a lot of work. It, it, it We got something that benefits more than one cost, not easily assignable, and that's a lot of effort, which is disproportionate to the results received. So with indirect cost, we do not have to track them like their direct cost, right? So it includes, it could include personnel, finance, um, off, uh, office rent, office building security services. They're all indirect cost. So if you have your aid department or agency has a federally negotiated indirect cost rate, you can use it for this grant. Many of you won't have that. It was a rates that were often more done came out of the out of the 60s and 70s. A lot of community action agencies have them. If you have one, you use it. If you don't have one, then you can use what's called the de minimis rate. It's 10% of your modified total direct cost. And that is specifically what the model with the total direct modified total direct cost is, is laid out very well in 2 CFR part 200.414. So once you calculate what that cost is, then you would be able to, um, then you could use 10% of that total modified, modified total direct cost to cover your indirect expenses. And the beautiful part of this part of using that modified total direct cost is no extra uh, documentation is needed. You do not, your, the whole idea here is not to have to track as a direct cost how much time your personnel department spent talking to your CPF paid for employee. Okay. And, and we'll, I can, throw this link in the chat, but there is um, on CPF resources by year, um, there is supplemental information on indirect cost. So if you have still have questions about indirect cost, and many of you may, there's the supplemental information available to you that walks you through the indirect, what's an indirect cost and how it's calculated and how you can calculate your modified total direct cost. So you can take 10% of that to cover these expenses. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is amendments, because just like we talked about with uh, construction, that things go wrong with budgets, sometimes they change. So we are able to do a budget amendment. We can get two changes to an approved budget. And for the process, for that process, we need to submit a revised budget along with a letter of justification on our letterhead telling our grant officer why we need to change the budget. We're going to add, we're going to tell them our grant officer the justification for the change. We're going to do an explanation of how the change is still consistent with congressional intent so we're not doing something that's inconsistent with the joint explanatory statement and we're going to explain why the change is needed. Now, for the part of our budget we're not changing, 
we could still continue to make draws, but we would not be able to make draws for, under this change until our grant officer approves it. Right, and I think, um, Jennifer, I'm gonna flip it back to you. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, and I'll stop sharing so you can start sharing. Sounds good. Um, in the process, um, we have been answering some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat. So, um, so okay, there. If you if you did pose some questions, go ahead and take a look. We may have answered them already. And Oh, you see DRG are there? We do, yes. Great. Okay, so we're going to just give you a really high level understanding of what DRGR is and how budgets work in DRGR. So for those who are unfamiliar with that acronym, DRGR stands for the Disaster Recovery Grant Reporting System. And in our last budget session, somebody said, well, why are we using the disaster recovery system for the CPF program? And that's a great question. Um, DRGR was originally established to manage CDBG disaster recovery grants. However, over the years, many grant programs have been added to DRGR, most recently the CPF program. So there are lots of programs using DRGR that are not disaster recovery. It's a very easy system for HUD to adapt. And this system is the system that will be used to set up your projects and activities, draw your funds and report on your outcomes. So it's a really important system in the overall process of administering your grant. Um, there's gonna be a lot more information to come on how you're gonna use DRGR there is already some information on the HUD exchange, including informational videos about using DRGR. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but we wanted to talk about it as it relates to budget. Uh, so folks get an initial understanding of how things will be set up. Again, you will not be going into set up this uh, budget structure in DRGR until your grant agreement is fully executed and HUD has triggered those things to happen in the system. But this is just to give you a roadmap of what's to come. So after the approval of your narrative and budget and your receipt of your fully executed grant agreement, you are going to set up your projects and activities in DRGR. DRGR is a hierarchical structure. So think of it like these stacking dolls that you see here in this photograph. Your total budget is the biggest pot of funds. That's your, your full grant amount for programs that have program income. It's going to include program income, but that's your total budget amount that you have to spend. That's your biggest pot of money. The next level is the project level. For many of you, you may only have one project, and so that's going to be your full budget amount as well. Um, and then the next level is activities. Activities is where all the detail lives in DRGR. So that's where you're going to spend most of your time working in the system. It's where you're going to provide your narrative descriptions. It's where you're going to set up your budget, make your draws, and where you're going to report on your outcomes. So the activity level is really the, the, the main area where you're going to be working in the system. Um, but just know that these are, they stack within each other. So um, your the sum of your activities cannot be more than the project budget in which those activities live, and then the sum of all your projects to the extent you have more than one um, cannot be larger than your overall total budget. So um, in addition to that, when you make obligations within your activity, the sum of all those obligations cannot be more than your activity budget. And then the sum of all the funds that you've drawn cannot be more than your obligations. So if you think of these sort of stacking dolls, I think it's a good visual for understanding how those different components fit together when you're budgeting within DRGR. And again, for many of you, this is this is you know several weeks off um, before you could even go in and start setting these things up. 
Uh, but it's good to understand where, where we're headed with all of this. And so inside the DRGR system, this is just a little peek inside the DRGR system with some screenshots. Um, when you log into DRGR, you're going to see a screen that has this blue banner bar with the different um, modules across the top represented by icons. This columns icon, that's our manage my grants module, and that's where you can go in to add your project and also later to add your activities. Um, when you set up a project in DRGR, there is some required information that needs to be completed with the asterisks, projects, project number, title. Those are things that you create a naming convention for, you provide a description, and then you enter your project budget. And like I said, if there's just one project budget, if there's just one project for your overall grant, that's going to be your full amount of grant funds. Um, there is a... DRGR quick guide on the HUD exchange. There are also videos for setting up your projects and activities on the HUD exchange already. Um, so those videos are super helpful step-by-step -step instructions. I would definitely um, check out the HUD exchange when you get to this stage and you'll be able to just follow along really easily with those videos. This next slide has a screenshot for setting up your activities. And remember, again, in DRGR, Activities is where all the detail lives, which is where all the action happens. Um, so because of that, we have a little bit more information that we like to collect when it comes to activities. Um, again, the videos and the DRGR quick guide are going to be your best friends when setting these up. It's going to walk you through all the steps. But if you do end up having questions about your project or activity setup, you can always use the ask a question feature. Um, either for CPF. There is also a DRGR ask a question pool. Um, so if you're having any technical concerns with DRGR, you can use that pool. Um, that pool does not answer the more policy related questions, but it can help you if you're getting some sort of error that you can't figure out something technical in nature, you can use the DRGR AAQ as well. So for um, activities, you're also going to, that's where you're going to establish your budget. And you can see that down here at the bottom in this yellow box. And then you're going to save everything. And then once all of that is approved, gets submitted to HUD, HUD approves it. That's when you can move on to start accessing funds. So here's a screenshot of the HUD exchange and those different DRGR videos that are available for review. So we have a video on how to submit your public act, I'm sorry, how to submit your action plan for review, um, how to add activities, how to add responsible organizations. Responsible organizations is the entity responsible for carrying out the activity and every activity needs a responsible organization. So those have to be set up separately and then associated to the activity. There's a video on establishing projects, setting up performance and accomplishment measures, and then adding and changing users. So this last one is more of an administrative type thing, not so much budget related. However, in DRGR, you will need both a user that is the draw requester and a user that is the draw approver. So at minimum, you will need two DRGR users in order to process your vouchers to receive your funds. So a draw requester and a draw approver. So um, if uh, initially, you'll have just one person set up, and then that person can go in and set up others to also use the system and provide those specific roles. So that video, even though it's administrative in nature, it will be important in terms of managing your funds because you'll have to set up a different additional users with those specific draw roles. So again, a couple of DRGR questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Whenever oh, you're ready, I got a couple oh, sure. of questions. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's just to just to say again, these videos are wonderful resources. Definitely check them out. Um, but I will go ahead and pop into the chat see, and see. So yeah, I can. Well, while we're while we're at it, I'm in there already. So um, is DRGR required to set up the project in DRGR? Yes, you must set okay. up a project before you set up your activities. The way the system works is that it is like. But work, I guess the question is: Are we? I'm sorry. The question is: Are we? Is every CPF grantee required to use DRGR? Yes. 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 In order to access your 
funds, you will have to use DRGR. That's how you get your money. Now, if someone's already got a, a DRGR account for a CDBG grant, do they need to have a separate login or will they be able to use their current login? They should be able to use their current login. Um, usually, so I think it's if if the same entity, so if it's a city that had a CDBG DR grant or a state, and then they this, that same entity, that city or that state, the same exact entity got the CPF grant, then that you'll see that on the drop downs, if you've been given access to that grant, you'll see both of those grants available for you. Um, each each user has to be associated to a grant in DRGR, but that will be available for you to be associated to if it's the same entity receiving the funds. All right. Um, let's see. I thought there was one other one. Oh, and I think you answered this one about adding users. So it can be there can be multiple users of DRGR that once the official initial person is granted access, they then go in and add and users, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. You will apps you will need to have multiple users. As I stated, the very minimum number of users that you may have is two. Because in order to process the vouchers in the system, you need somebody to set the voucher up. That's called a draw requester. And then you need someone to approve that voucher before it's sent to HUD for processing. And that person's called the draw approver. So at the absolute minimum, you need two users. As best practices, we like to say have two of each role. That way, if somebody's out of the office, on sick leave, vacation, they win the lottery, they don't come back to work. <laughs> you have a backup for each of those roles. Um, yeah, so definitely at least two, preferably more than that if, if you have the staff. Um, yeah, and so I see, again, someone had asked what is DRGR stand for? That's the Disaster Recovery Grant Reporting System. But again, that system is used for grants outside of DR as well. There's about 12 grants, I think, 11 or 12 different grant programs now in DRGR. Um, so that that's why CPF is in there as well. Um, and then I saw a question about whether you have to set up a project. And so that's the question I was answering before. Yes, you have to set up projects in DRGR. Um, it is the first step before you move on to setting up activities because your activities will ask you, which project does this activity live in? So you'll need to set up your projects first. Um, and then should we wait until we have an approved budget and budget narrative before we add our projects? Yes, in fact, you won't be able to set up those things in DRGR until HUD basically allows, you know, kind of flips the switch, so to speak to let you go in and set those things up in um, in DRGR. So you're going to have to have your fully signed grant agreement. Um, OK. Oh, how do we get a DRGR login? So that's something that HUD will set up for you. Once you have your uh, your fully signed grant agreement, they will, they will have that set up. Um, Yeah, so Tracy answered that question. Thank you, Tracy. The authorized representative for the awards listed on the SF-424 would receive a login information to DRGR after the grant is executed. Great. Great DRGR questions today, guys. Thank you for those. These are really helpful for everyone to have a better understanding of the system. All right. Any Okay, so going to the next slide, then I think that that hit all the DRGR questions. Feel free to keep submitting questions as we um, head towards the end of the session here, but we're going to provide some uh, next steps. So our next session uh, for this cohort series is an office hour session on budget, and that session will be on February 13th from 2 to 3. Eastern time. Um, so again, in the office hours session, this is a great opportunity for everyone to bring their more specific questions. Um, you learned a lot of information today. You're gonna go back, apply that to the budgets that you're either just starting or have 
started on but are still finalizing, you might have some questions as you do that, please bring them to office hours or just show up and listen to the questions that others have because I think that's a great way to learn is to hear what, what your peers are working through. Um, so definitely okay. think about that. And I think Stan had a little homework request. Right, yeah. So <laughs> we, in Absorb, there is, uh, where, where you registered for the class, the the construct the construction and non-construction budget formats are there in Excel and instructions for what is to be included in each of those line items, some guidance on what can be included in those line items are there as well. We'd like for you, if you can, to work on those between now and Tuesday at two o'clock and bring your questions uh, to the office hours. Uh, we did have one question about um, a planning grant or planning where the only activity is planning and whether that's construction or non-construction. It's really gonna depend on what your narrative says, what's in the joint explanatory statement of what it's going to say. But remember those budget formats may end up being both. You may be using line items for both. So if you're paying for staff, paying for a program and building something, you would use line items from both of those budget formats. So your budget needs to match what you're doing for the project and be consistent with the narrative. So if it's just planning and you're hiring a, an architectural firm to design, to see about doing a site plan and designing something, that's what would be in your budget. Other project, other other things that were funded were, you know, buying a hotel and converting it to permanent supportive housing. And so then you would have construction because you're doing rehab and you may also be uh, having some program costs that may be in your narrative and in the joint explanatory statement that after it's up and running, you may have some money in your budget that you're going to use for services for the residents. That would be an example of having construction and non-construction in your budget. <clears throat> okay, so the homework, we had a question about the homework. It's in when folks uh, register, they did it in a, where they registered is a system called Absorb. The files are there, and I believe, and Sonia may correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they're also going to be emailed to people as well. Yes, you are correct. Okay, I, all right. I, just, I got something um, right. <laughs> I just added to the chat too, just what um, Stan said. However, if anybody's having trouble accessing the course in Absorb or is um, unsure about what Absorb is, even though you know it's probably where you want to register, but I understand there's a lot of different information flying at everyone. So if you need any help at all, you can always reach out to the cohorts at tdainc.org email box, and the folks there can help you through any of the technical pieces of participating in the cohort. Um, or even if you have content related questions, they can get them to the right people. So um, that's a great uh, contact email address for any questions related to cohorts. So again, that's cohorts at tdainc.org. Um, so for the person asking for the absorb link, go ahead and email cohorts at tdainc.org and then they'll make sure that you get the link and that you're all properly set up. Okay, and somebody had asked, can we utilize expenses incurred prior to the agreement being executed, but after the grant has been awarded? And then Tracy answered that question. I'm just reading this off so that everybody has the benefit of it in case you're not following the chat. Um, so the answer to that question of can they use expenses incurred prior to the agreement, but prior to the agreement being executed, but after the grant award has been made. And the answer was expenses incurred after 12-29-22 for the project are eligible for reimbursement. And that's, that information is also in the grant guide as well. If you don't write this down. Yeah, the grant guide. Again, that grant guide is a wonderful um, resource on the HUD exchange, on the CPS page. Um, Definitely, if you haven't already taken a look at that, I really encourage everyone to just take some time and read through it. It is, um, it'll clarify a lot of things. Okay. 
I'm scrolling through to see if I missed any pertinent questions. I think hopefully we got them, but we will uh, we will go through them. And if there's ones we haven't answered, as Jennifer noted, we will get the answers and get them distributed. Absolutely. So, all right. So we are asking everyone to participate in an evaluation survey. Uh, you will receive that survey from the cohorts at tvainc.org mailing um, mailbox. So there's that email address again. Um, when you receive that survey, please complete it. It's very quick. It doesn't take very long, but it gives us a lot of really good information to improve not only this cohort that we're in as we move forward, but future cohorts that we'll be doing. So we really appreciate the time you take in answering those evaluation surveys after each of the four sessions. With that, I think that Yeah, concludes unless uh, Connor today. or Tracy have any parting words. Yeah. Thanks, Stan. Um, let me think. Yeah, I guess I would like to specify, and I know that um, that Stan and Jennifer did a good job of explaining all of the, uh, and answering all the DRGR questions. Um, I did just want to give a really quick overview, sort of put it all in a nutshell, because there were a lot of DRGR related questions here. Um, just as a reminder, um, DRGR access is going to be given and granted to you guys once you have submitted all of your grant materials to your grant officer, they've been approved, and you've received a fully executed grant agreement. Once your organization receives a fully executed grant agreement, meaning that your organization signed and HUD signed off on it, that will automatically trigger a process in our office to where we set you up with a DRGR user account. Um, the first person in your organization to receive this account will be the person that is indicated as the authorized representative for your organization. Once they get set up, um, you'll, of course, need to add a second user um, because you'll need two users to approve vouchers. You, as the authorized representative, will be the one to actually do the user request for that second, third, fourth user in DRGR. Um, so all the DRGR stuff is comes after you submit um, your full grant package, your grant officer, it's approved, and then everything's executed. So... Um, so for right now, for these cohorts, I think it's more important to focus on all the aspects of getting your grant package executed and approved. And then once that's all done, then it'll shift over to the DRGR side. Um, and I'd also like to mention too, that any, once you get DRGR access, any DRGR issues or questions, um, you can ask your grant officer about, and they will refer you to your systems officers. So systems officers are staff in our division that support the grant officers and um, grantees in their portfolio with DRGR system issues, troubleshooting, et cetera. So once you get access to DRGR, your grant package is all complete. Um, then you can start working on the second step with your systems officer, which is going to be all the DRGR stuff. So I hope that wasn't too, too winded. I just kind of wanted to give a overview of you know, how a DRGR kind of happens on the back end once the grant package steps are all complete. All right, great, thank you. Okay. Um, so I just saw, I was just having a little exchange here about the session one slides. Um, folks were looking for those. They should be posted and absorbed. We will double check and make sure that they are up there. Um, Thank you for raising that question. We will double check that and make sure that they're there for everyone. All right. Thank you, Connor, for um, going over that process again. I know all these different processes can, can be confusing and hard to keep track of. So thank you for um, just clarifying that for everyone once again. And thank you also and thank you, Tracy, for helping to answer some of the chat questions. It's been really, really great as that, we've gone. That was wonderful. Slide. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So with that, I think we will wrap up today's session. I just saw another late baking breaking question asking about what is absorb. So that is the session where you signed up for this cohort. However, if you need help getting to absorb, um, 
accessing it, resetting passwords or anything like that, go ahead and email cohorts at tvainc.org. You can see that email address there on the screen. It's also where you're going to get the survey um, email from, but um, you can email that email address if you have any questions about Absorb, any technical questions, you need to reach someone to ask a content question. This is your sort of lifeline for cohorts. <laughs> so go ahead and send anything you need to that address and we'll get it to the, to the right folks. All right, thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at office hours on the 13th. Please bring all of your budget related questions. Try to do that homework that Stan asked for because that will help you figure out what questions you need to ask during office hours and get you closer to submitting your materials. So thank you all, have a great day and a great weekend coming up.